The philosophy of mind is a peculiar branch of philosophy in several respects. One is this. Most areas of philosophy, there's pretty much of a consonance between our common sense belief and what the professionals accept. But in the philosophy of mind, I think there is a radical break. I think most people and, and common sense people accept some version of dualism. They think they've got a mental part to their life and a physical part. Dualism seems to have a kind of appeal, but in the technical subjects, in the philosophy of mind, in cognitive science, in psychology, dualism is almost universally rejected. I won't say universally because I can name several prominent dualists. Not, nothing ever dies completely in philosophy. But there is a break here between the appeal of dualism, the kind of common sense appeal, and its rejection by the professionals. I often wondered if our... Um, commitment to dualism, our deep uh, affinity with dualist philosophy was a peculiarity of the Western intellectual tradition, but I think it actually has a much wider appeal. This was brought home to me when I lectured once in Bombay, and I was on the, the same platform with the Dalai Lama. I don't often lecture in the presence of religious figures, um, but I was struck by the fact that he gave a lecture which was almost straight Descartes. He said, each of us is a mind and a body. He didn't have the stuff about uh, the pineal gland and so on. It wasn't like that, but it was very much in the spirit of Cartesianism. And another thing I'm struck by is how much of our contemporary debates are conditioned by the Cartesian vocabulary. So the vocabulary of mind and body, matter and spirit, material and spiritualism, all of those are familiar to us today and they were familiar in Descartes' time. Now in this lecture we're going to be talking about some of the alternatives to Cartesian dualism. And you remember Descartes had a dualism of substances. There are two types of substances in the world. Strictly speaking, there is a third type. God, he said, was neither mental nor physical. But in the world where we live, uh, there are two types of substances. There's the mental and the physical. Now, one way to try to get out of some of Descartes' problems is to adopt not substance dualism, but property dualism. And that is a view that uh, still survives, the idea that there aren't two different kinds of metaphysical entities in the universe, but there are at least two different kinds of properties. There are mental properties and physical properties, and that view is called property dualism as opposed to substance dualism. Uh, I put a chart of all the, uh, poss or at least a bunch of the possibilities, and I'll go through it later, but we need to make a distinction within dualism between the Descartes brand of substance dualism and the more popular uh, contemporary version of property dualism. However, I have to say that property dualism seems to inherit many of the same problems we had with Descartes, how do I know you have these properties? How can the mental properties ever affect the physical properties? How do we get a solution to the problem of the freedom of the will? So many of the problems that we had with Descartes' substance dualism are still left with us if we have property dualism. And I think it's fair to say that after Descartes, a very large number, and in the end, most philosophers, ex accepted some version of monism. I mean, Descartes asked how many kinds of things are there and got up to two. Uh, most of his successors only got as far as one. Now, later on, when it gets to be my turn to tell you my views, I'm going to say the mistake was to start counting at all, okay? That was the big mistake. The big mistake is the one we're all overlooking. We're accepting the Cartesian categories. We're thinking all of this is okay, this vocabulary of mind and body. However, I can't say that yet. Right now, I'm still locked in the Cartesian tradition, trying to consider alternatives to it. And the natural inclination is to say, look, if dualism doesn't work, if two-ism doesn't work, go with one-ism. And uh, th th what you get then is not dualism, but various forms of monism. Monism says there's only one kind of thing in the universe. And then all of these people in the Cartesian tradition are inclined to say, well, either you, you get a choice. You can either pick the mental part of Descartes or you can pick the physical part. Idealism is the view that all of reality is mental. 
that uh, there isn't any physical reality in addition to mental reality. And what we think of as physical reality ultimately is mental. Now, idealism, I think, though not very plausible, did have a long and influential history. It was very influential throughout the 19th century. The most influential figure was Hegel, but it was also influential in Britain and the United States. In the long run, I think it died because the successes of the physical sciences just made it seem preposterous that reality was all spiritual. I, I'm not, that's not an argument. I think this is just how the subject developed. And nowadays, idealism is not an influential view, though it survives in odd corners. I mean, it keeps cropping up in literary theory, for example. There are people in literary theory who say, well, all of reality is a social construct. All of reality is like a work of fiction. We all just sort of get together with our minds and create this reality. I, 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 I'm not uh, going to spend much time on that, but I do think it's not a serious view. I think it's a rather silly view. Uh, and the people who think reality is a social construct, that basically it's what we think it is, don't themselves often just voluntarily walk out of 20 uh, first-story windows uh, on the theory that, well, gravity is a social construct. We can do anything we want with it. I mean, there is a kind of brute physical reality out there that we have to respect, as Russell would say, even in these most abstruse of disciplines. So not surprisingly, the most popular version of monism and the dominant version in the 20th century has been materialism, the idea that ultimately reality is as described in subjects like physics and chemistry. And the problem, in a way, if you look back over the 20th century, the problem has to, been to try to get a version of materialism which was, wasn't subject to obvious objections. And I'm now going to lead you through several of the most influential, indeed I will lead you through all of the most influential versions of materialism in the 20th century and we will see that there are various patterns of argument that emerge. Now, before we jump off the deep end into the different possibilities that materialism has, let me tell you a little bit about philosophical argument. In philosophical argument of this kind, we tend to oscillate between the trivial and the apocalyptic. Uh, so we're always stuck in these little bitty technical sounding arguments, but in fact, you've got to keep your eye on the big target. So there's this constant oscillating back and forth between uh, the, the, the picayune and the universal, between little bitty examples, and I'll give you some of those uh, in a few minutes, and then these much larger issues. So we go through these examples, but always keep your eye on the fact that there are larger philosophical issues at stake, that basically we're fighting about very large targets. Well, in the early days of the 20th century, beginning really in the 1920s and continuing, I would say, through the 50s, the most influential version of materialism was behaviorism. And the idea of behaviorism was that essentially mind is just behavior, uh, that when we study the mind, what we're interested in is studying the behavior of a human being or an animal. And, and in the extreme version, the idea was, and indeed, there isn't anything else there. There's just the behavior. There isn't any reality to mental phenomena other than what is manifested in behavior. Behaviorism came in two flavors. Uh, there was methodological behaviorism, which was a doctrine in psychology that said psychologists should quit worrying about the soul, because you can't do a scientific study of the soul. They should just study behavior. And if in my childhood, to course in psychology, that was a psychology behavior. I don't know if say that or not, but in science, but I'm telling you, I get them. Uh, methodological influence, a whole generation of psychologists were by, uh, that were not studying mental reality. We're just trying to get laws of behavior. We're trying to find out uh, how stimulus, outside stimulus, 
stimulus uh, produce a response, and then you'd get laws correlating stimulus and response. I guess the, the, the guiding light of this was a, was a psychologist named Watson, but there were, as I said, a whole generation, particularly in the United States, of American psychologists who accepted methodological behaviorism. In philosophy, the situation was even more extreme because the philosophers who were inclined to behaviorism didn't just accept methodological behaviorism, but there was another stronger version of behaviorism, sometimes called logical behaviorism or analytical behaviorism. And the doctrine of logical behaviorism was not just it's useful to study behavior when studying the mind, but rather there isn't anything else there to study. That when we talk about the mind, we're really just talking about actual and possible behavior. So when we say uh, that John believes it's going to rain, what that means literally is uh, if the windows are open, uh, John will close them. If John goes for a walk, he'll carry uh, his umbrella and his raincoat. If John owns a convertible and the top's down, he'll put the top up. If John's garden tools are outside, he'll put them in the shed, and so on. That is, the idea of logical behaviorism was that, logically speaking, any statement about the mind can be translated into, it just means the same as, a set of statements about behavior. Now, notice the behavior needn't be actual behavior, but rather statements about what would happen if, if the windows are open, John would close them. If he goes for a walk, he will take his raincoat. So you get a series of conditional statements, and one of the problems that the behaviors had was how to spell out exactly what the terms of the conditions are. So the I, but the but the intuitive idea is clear. The intuitive idea is that's it. There's nothing to the mind except your actual and possible behavior, except what you are doing and what you would do under certain conditions. Now, not surprisingly, there were a lot of objections to behaviorism, and there's a curious feature of the philosophical and psychological literature on this subject if you study it. It's this. If you look at what people actually debated, they often debated fairly technical issues. What is the nature of the conditionals? How do we spell out the antecedent of the conditional, the if clause? If so and so, then such and such behavior would result. But the real deep worry was much stronger. The real deep worry was a kind of common sense worry that it can't be right to say the mind is behavior, because each of us knows in our own case that when, for example, we feel a pain, feeling the pain is one thing, behaving in the way that's appropriate to having pains is another thing. And indeed, that objection to behaviorism was put in the 1920s, in the early days. It was put by uh, Ogden and Richards, by I.A. Richards and C.K. Ogden, uh, when they said, look, uh, to believe in behaviorism is in effect to feign anesthesia, is to pretend you've been anesthetized, because we all know in our own case there's got to be a difference between our actually having a feeling and our behaving as if we had a feeling. Now, that's the gut feel objection to behaviorism, and when I was a kid, uh, that was always seemed to me that was the deep objection. But let me tell you about some of the technical objections, because they pave the way for our contemporary view that the mind is really a computer program. Here are some of the technical objections. First of all, the behaviorist seems to leave out an important feature about the relation of mind to behavior. We want to be able to say that our mental states cause our behavior. So it's because I'm in pain that I cry out, take aspirin, go to the doctor, rub the sore spot, and whatever. That is, the behaviorist misses an essential feature Namely, mental states are causally responsible for behavior, and you miss that point if you find yourself saying, well, look, there isn't anything there to do the causing, there's just the behavior, because we want to be able to say, no, that guy cries out because he's in pain. John closes the window because he believes it's going to rain. All right, now, subsequent theories are going to satisfy that urge, but we've got to see how they get there. 
Now, a second difficulty with behaviorism is there seems to be a kind of circularity in the analysis. Now, let me show you how that works. I said the behaviorists wanted to analyze uh, John believes it's going to rain into a set of conditional statements about John's behavior. If the windows are open, John will close them. Uh, if uh, the garden tools are outside, John will bring them back in. But wait a second. All of that was assuming that John doesn't like to get wet, that he doesn't want a room full of water, that he doesn't want rusty garden tools. But suppose there's nothing he likes better than rain pouring in the window or a lot of rusty garden tools. That's really, he's an esthete. He loves the sight of rusty garden tools and, and wet furniture. Uh, well, then the behavioral analysis isn't going to work. You've got to bring in another element. You've got to say, and he doesn't want to get wet. So you can only analyze his belief that uh, it's, rain, it's going to rain in terms of what he will do if you suppose he's got a desire, the desire to keep dry, the desire to keep his furniture dry, the desire to keep himself dry. If you don't make that assumption, the analysis won't work. So it looks like there's a circularity. In order to analyze belief, you got to presuppose desire. And in order to analyze desire, you got to presuppose belief. The same thing goes for desire. If you want to say, well, John desires to be with Sally, uh, what that means is John will call up Sally on the phone, see if he can make a date, uh, try to get to uh, go to her house, try to be with her, and so on. Well, that's only on the assumption that he believes the woman he's talking to is Sally. If he believes it's somebody else, uh, if he believes it's somebody that he doesn't like at all, then he will not behave in that way. So it turns out to analyze desire, you've got to assume belief. To analyze belief, you've got to assume desire. And that looks like we didn't, with behaviorism, get rid of the mind, which is what we were trying to do. We were trying to get rid of mental states because we got to presuppose mental states in order to give the behavioral analysis. Okay, a third, I, get, I call these technical objections, they're not all that technical, but they pave the way for changes in the discipline. A third, more or less technical objection was, well, wait a second, we can think of counterexamples. If being in pain was just behaving in a certain way, then it would be impossible for somebody to pretend to be in pain when they weren't in pain, and it would be impossible for somebody to have a pain without showing the pain. But we all know those are possible. You can imagine a perfect actor. Suppose there's somebody who's such a fabulous super actor that she can do a perfect imitation of somebody in pain or in grief and all the same not feel anything. So you and analogously on the other side, imagine somebody who's a super Spartan, somebody who feels pain but doesn't show it. Somebody who can suffer pain without any manifestation whatever. So it looks like behaviorism isn't going to work. And by the late 50s, um, behaviorism was beginning, well, I won't say beginning, was really running out of gas. Now, let me tell you some of the names of the leading behaviorists. Gilbert Ryle, uh, who was a professor of mine at Oxford, I wrote a book called The Concept of Mind, which was perhaps the single most famous book. But behaviorism was also common to the logical positivist movement, which was originally centered in Vienna and then uh, after the war was very influential in both the United States and Britain. And uh, I guess uh, Carl Gustav Hempel or Peter Hempel of Princeton was perhaps the best known uh, behaviorist on this particular, uh, 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 from that particular movement. So there were plenty of influential behaviorists. But behaviorism began to be replaced in the 50s by a doctrine called physicalism, or sometimes called the identity theory. And the idea of physicalism, I'll just call that the identity theory, is that we should think not of the mind as behavior, but really the mind just is the brain. The logical behaviorist said that there is a logical, uh, a logically necessary relation between behavior and mental phenomena, so that to have the mental phenomena and to engage in the behavior are logically the same thing. Now, the physicalist identity theorist said, no, it isn't a matter of logic. It's just that's how the world turned out. Descartes might have been right. It might have been that there were two kinds of things in the world, but it didn't turn out that way. The way that it in fact happened 
is that it turns out that all of our mental states and processes are brain states and processes. Every mental state is a brain state. Every mental process is a brain process. So, for example, the example they like to give, feeling pain is just having your C fibers stimulated. C fibers are a type of axon. Hey, by the way, that's terrible neurobiology. I mean, I, I forgive them, innocent people. They didn't know anything about the brain. It couldn't possibly be the case that, uh, that these uh, long axons are the locus of pains. But anyway, we'll pretend. We're doing a, a fantasy neurobiology here for a minute. They said C fiber stimulation and, and pain are identical. And that was just a fact that we discover about the world. It's not a matter of logic. It might have been that Descartes might have been right. There might have been these souls floating around. There just aren't any in fact. In fact, if you open up the skull, there's just a brain in there. And what we think of as mental states are just brain states. Now, there were some, nice, uh, some nice technical arguments then about, well, what about this nature, this identity relation between the mental state and the brain state? And somebody noticed that it does seem implausible to suppose that every type of mental state has to be identical with a certain type of brain state. So I believe Denver's the capital of Colorado and you believe Denver's the capital of Colorado. Must there be exactly the same thing in our brain in order to have that belief? Maybe it's different. Maybe what's going on in your brain is different from what goes on in my brain even though we both believe that Denver's the capital of Colorado. So in order to get over that difficulty, uh, a difficulty that Ned Block enabled neuronal chauvinism uh, the idea that somehow or other uh, only people with neurons and only people with certain kinds of neurons can have mental states. Uh, Block pointed out we need to be able to account for the fact that we might build a machine that was in pain. We might someday make an artificial brain that could feel pain and we wouldn't use neurons at all. So the, the physicalist said, well, there is a way that we can avoid this difficulty and that is instead, instead of saying that every type of mental state is identical with some type of brain state, let's merely say that any particular token instance of a mental state is identical with some particular token instance of a brain state. And I want to remind you of that jargon of type and token. It was originally introduced into philosophy by the American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. Peirce pointed out that if I write the word dog three times, there's a question, how many words have I written? One or three? Well, I've written one type of word, because there's only one type word, dog, but I've written three token instances of that word. Types are abstract entities. Tokens are concrete particulars. Now, applying that to the present problem, what people who were inclined to physicalism said was, well, instead of saying that every mental state is identical with some type of, uh, every mental state is identical with some type of brain state, let's go to token physicalism and say that every token mental state has to be identical with some particular token and then that allows for what's going on in your brain may be different from what's going on in my brain even though we have the same mental states and it allows for uh, the possibility that we can avoid neuronal chauvinism we might get to the point where we could say let's build an artificial brain and we won't use brain material at all we won't use neurons at all but silicon chips or something like that so token physicalism was a natural development out of type physicalism. Now you see what we're doing uh, as we go through these possibilities. Monism is, looks like the only way to escape Descartes' problems. But idealism isn't going to work. That, that puts us in bed with Hegel and a whole lot of mystical and mysterious people. We want to be tough, no, hard-nosed scientists here. We want to be materialists. Okay, well, behaviorism was tried and failed. 
So we went to the identity theory. Instead of saying mind is logically the same as behavior, we say it just happens. The world turned out that way, that mental states are identical with physical states. It would be elegant if every mental state was identical with some type a physical state, but that's too implausible. A world isn't that elegant. It's going to be messier. So we avoid neuronal chauvinism by postulating a token identity between the mental and the physical. But now that raises a serious question for us, which the type identity theorists didn't have. And that question is, if my belief that Denver is the capital of Colorado is identical with one token, let's say, I suppose, in my left frontal cortex, in my brain, and your belief that De Denver's the capital of Colorado is identical with something in your right, in the other side for you, the, your, uh, the opposite cor cortex from my cortex. If those are two different brain states, then what fact about them makes them the same mental state? If you've got different physical states, what is it about the different physical states that makes them into the same mental state? Now, notice there's a common sense answer to that, and that is, well, you're thinking the same thing. But they can't give that answer because that sounds like dualism. You see, we're all along presupposing there's nothing going on in there except physical phenomena. We can't have property dualism or substance dualism. So the common sense answer, well, all of my mental states are realized somehow or other in my brain, that's not an answer they can give unless they can give a complete description of the mental in terms of the physical. These analyses are intended to be reductive. We're trying to get rid of any Cartesian phenomena. There mustn't be any little a, a Cartesian soul sticking out here, not even little bitty ones. It's all got to be materialistic down to the ground. So we've got to answer the question, what is it that two brain states have in common if they're the same mental state? And we've got to answer that question without making reference to any mental entities. It's got to be analyzed in terms of physical phenomena. Well, a beautiful device was invented called functionalism. And functionalism is the natural growth out of t t token, token identity theory. What the functionalists said, and this now we're up to the, to the uh, present time, most philosophers today are functionalists. And the idea of functionalism is this. Any mental state will consist entirely in a set of causal relations. So, to have a belief that it's going to rain will just be a, to have a something that is caused by certain kinds of input stimuli and in conjunction with other mental states causes certain kinds of output behavior. So let's go through it. If you take a bunch of sentences about belief, John sees dark clouds. John believes it's going to rain. John takes his umbrella uh, because John wants to stay dry. Now, I take a very simple common sense case. Okay, now the idea is take the word belief and knock it out. Just put an X there. Then a belief is anything that stands in those causal relations. It's anything that can be caused by the perception that it's going to rain, and together with a desire to keep dry will cause you to do such thing as wearing your raincoat and carrying your umbrella. So you get a complete analysis of mental states in terms of causal relations between input stimuli coming in, other mental states, and output behavior. I want everybody to understand this because it is the leading step on the way to the computational theory of the mind. The theory that the mind is a computer has this as its essential idea, that the mind is to be thought of causally as a device that mediates input stimuli and output behavior. Now, notice how all those problems with behaviorism, they just pass uh, uh, away here. That is, behaviorism we objected to by saying 
that uh, it couldn't account for the causal relations. Well, we got those now. I mean, that's the essence of the mind, is the causal relations. And that circularity worry we had with behaviorism, that in order to analyze belief, you've got to presuppose desire. In order to analyze desire, you've got to presuppose belief. Functionalists are just as happy as clams with that idea, because it's all going to come out in the wash. We're going to analyze everything all at once as a whole set of causal relations. All of the mental states will be analyzed as X's and Y's standing in certain causal relations to input stimuli to each other and to output behavior. Well, I said everything is going to come out just fine, but there is a problem here. The common sense objection to functionalism. And there were a lot of philosophers who didn't buy any of this story. And I want to tell you about some of the arguments they advanced, because some of these arguments I think are actually right. Uh, the most famous argument, again, was a kind of common sense argument. Now, notice how we've been oscillating between the technical objections and the common sense objections. But the, the most powerful argument, I think, was a common sense argument, and it was put forward by uh, the uh, philosopher at NYU, Tom Nagel, in a famous article called, uh, what, what is it like to be a bat? And Nagel gave the following example. He said, look, you might have a perfect knowledge of some organism. You might have a perfect knowledge of bat physiology, but there'd be something left out. Namely, what's it feel like? You see, think of bats. Bats hang upside down uh, all day long. Now, what does that feel like, to hang upside down all day long? Uh, and then when night comes, they fly around navigating uh, by a sonar, by bouncing. Uh, they navigate not by seeing anything, but by bouncing sonar, uh, bouncing sound waves off of objects and then detecting the presence of the object from the sound waves. Well, you might have a perfect bat physiology. You might know everything there was to know about the bat's input stimulus and about the uh, physiology and about the output behavior. You might, and you might have everything a materialist could want, but something gets left out. What's it like? And that is, looks like, that's the essence of the mental. And to add insult to injury here, some philosophers have introduced a piece of jargon for this, what's it like or what does it feel like? Uh, they call these things qualia. Any theory of the mind has got to account for an interesting fact. Namely, all of our conscious experiences have a certain qualitative feel to them. There's some sort of qualia going on. The singular is quale here. You've got a quale or a whole lot of qualia whenever you've got any, mental any conscious mental phenomenon at all. And it looks like, as Nagel says, that's the hard problem. That's the hard mind-body problem left over. Now, notice we're right back with Descartes here, because that Descartes would have understood all of that. He would have said, that's right. Consciousness is the essence of the mind, and you don't get rid of consciousness with any kind of physical analysis, because you're going to have the qualia left over. You're going to have the what's it like or what does it feel like left over. And this problem, the what's it like problem, is the problem that's left over after any functional analysis. A couple of other arguments lead to the same conclusion. There's a beautiful argument by an Australian philosopher named Frank Jackson. Jackson uh, argues as follows. Imagine that there were a, a neurobiologist who knew all there was to know about vision. She knows everything, call her Mary. Mary knows everything there is to know about human vision. She knows everything about the color receptors and everything uh, about the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus and the striate and the extra striate and all of the feedback mechanisms. There's only one problem. Uh, Mary has been brought up entirely in a black and white environment. She's never seen red. Now, though she might have an absolutely perfect knowledge of what causes people to have experiences of red, she might have a perfect knowledge of what the, uh, the, of the input stimulus and the output behavior, all the same, something got left out. Something got left out, and that is the conscious experience of seeing red. She has none of that. But then it turns out there's going to be some facts that are simply left out of any, not just any functionalist analysis, but any materialist analysis. Materialism in, throughout its history has had this problem keep cropping up on it. The problem is, after you've given the materialist story, something got left out, qualia, or what it feels like, or the actual target of the investigation, consciousness, because that is the essential thing we have to analyze.
It was a third argument along these lines suggested by Saul Kripke, a philosopher at Princeton. Kripke said, look, if you're talking about identity, and if you identify the terms of the identity relation in terms of their essential features in a way that you might identify uh, that guy as Bill and that guy as uh, Mr. Clinton, well, and you say Bill is Mr. Clinton, the President of the United States, then if you've identified one and the same guy, then the, re then the identity relation has to be necessary. There's no way Clinton might be some other guy. That is, if he's Clinton, he's necessarily Clinton. Now, similarly, uh, Kripke argued, if C-fiber stimulations were identical with pains, they'd have to be necessarily pains. You couldn't imagine a situation in which C-fiber stimulations weren't identical with pains. But nothing's easier. You can easily imagine a situation in which people have C-fiber stimulations but don't have pains, and a situation in which they have pains but don't have C-fiber stimulations. So it can't be the case that conscious states are identical with brain states. Because if they were identical with brain states, that would have to be a necessary identity. But it's not a necessary identity. The most you would get would be some kind of correlation. And if it's not a necessary identity, it can't be an identity at all. Okay, let's step back and look what's going on then in this debate. What we've been considering is, given that idealism is dead, what sorts of versions of materialism will enable us to account for mental phenomena? And the general pattern was very revealing. The pattern was always, there were a whole lot of technical objections. That's what we saw in the case of, of uh, uh, behaviorism and what we saw in the case of uh, 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 the type identity theory and what we saw in the case of functionalism. But in fact, the underlying objection was much deeper, and that is something gets left out. In every one of these cases, we leave out the essential feature of the mind, and that is put in various ways by describing it as qualia, or what it's like, or what it feels like, and oh, I like to put it, just left out consciousness. Okay, but now let's move on. I mean, people were aware of these difficulties, and this, this debate goes on. As, as we sit here, uh, there are articles being written right now answering Tom Nagel, and books being written answering Frank Jackson or, or Saul Kripke. But at this point, there occurred a wonderful development that people thought was the greatest breakthrough in the history of the subject. Now, let me set the stage for that development. I said functionalism defines mental states in terms of their causal relations. But now the natural inclination is to say, yeah, well, tell us more. What's the mechanism? What is the nature of the mechanism by which the input stimuli produces the output behavior? Now, some people said, look, don't worry about it. That's for science to figure out, and it may take another 100 years. Just think of the brain as a kind of a black box. Uh, and it doesn't matter how, how it works. It could Maybe it works with some other kinds of machinery. will do just as well. What we're interested in is the philosophical analysis of the mind in terms of input stimuli, uh, internal causal relations, and output behavior. Those guys, not surprisingly, were called black box functionalists. But that's unsatisfying. What we want to know is, how does it work? What's the nature of the mechanism? And at this point, at this point in our intellectual history, in our very lifetimes, occurred a confluence of several major intellectual movements that gave people what they thought of as the greatest breakthrough in 2,000 years. It created an entirely new discipline, which is going on since then. It's the new discipline is called cognitive science. And the confluence consisted of these elements. You had this development in philosophy of materialism through uh, behaviorism, the identity theory, and functionalism. And at the same time, you had the burgeoning new subject of computer science, and in particular, the branch of computer science that is called artificial intelligence. The aim to create artificially in computing machinery behavior which, if it were engaged in by human beings, we would recognize as intelligent behavior. So we have these two strands. On the one hand, we've got the philosophy of mind with these uh, materialist philosophers trying to solve the philosophical problems, and there's a wonderful technological device suddenly available to them, 
the modern digital computer and a whole discipline of people trying to program computers so their behavior can be as intelligent as the behavior of human beings. And they were brought together by a third element of this confluence, the developments in cognitive psychology that had now gone beyond behaviorism and were trying to find the actual mechanisms by which the input stimulus was converted into the intelligent output behavior. So these three disciplines, psychology, artificial intelligence as a branch of computer science and philosophy, suddenly joined together. And I hardly need to tell you there was a bandwagon effect. We had a whole lot of linguists, uh, anthropologists, uh, sociologists, and people in other disciplines as well. I mean, interdisciplinary is one of the great buzzwords of the 20th century, and cognitive science is nothing if not interdisciplinary. So sometime in the late 70s and early 80s, all of this came came together into a brand new discipline of cognitive science, which had the two great merits which any do, new discipline must have. It must seem exciting to the young, and it must be well-funded. Uh, there was a lot of money in those days uh, for precisely this kind of research. Now, furthermore, it wasn't just that we had this money that we were going to do this stuff with, but we had a theory. And the theory promised an answer to all of those hard questions that we had been having before. The theory was, we now know the nature of the function by which the input stimulus is converted into the output behavior. There's a computer inside your skull. There may be several computers in there working in parallel, but whatever else is going on, your brain is a digital computer, uh, and, or, or as I said, a series of computers working in parallel, and what you call your mind is really the computer program or programs. So at long last, as, as one famous researcher in this field, Zenon Pollution, put it, after 2,000 years, we at long last have a way of seeing the answer to the questions that bothered Descartes and the questions that go back to the Greeks. How can mental states affect behavior? How can the semantic content of our thoughts actually result in our behavior? We know the answer. The answer is that they do it in exactly the same way that the abstract symbols of the computer program produce the behavior of the computer. And the secret is implementation. You implement the computer program in an actual hardware. Your abstract mind is implemented in the hardware of your brain. And as I, I summarize this by saying, on the strong AI view, on the strong artificial intelligence view, the mind is to the brain as the program is to the hardware. Now remember, I distinguish strong AI from weak AI. Weak AI says you can use the computer to study the mind as you can use it to study anything. But the strong AI view is much more exciting. The strong AI view says the most exciting thing that you could say to anybody, and that is you can create a mind by sitting at your computer console and designing the right programs, you will be literally creating minds. I debated somebody about this in London, and this was his final claim. We are creating minds. It is a very exciting project. Unfortunately, it is totally mistaken for reasons I hope to explain in the next lecture.